Okay, so I'll try to give a, a quick summary of my PhD. And of course, there is uh, way too much I want to <laughs> talk about and tell you, but uh, I will do my best to uh, to do it within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, my PhD is uh, named Environmental Constraints in Hydropower Scheduling for Long Planning Horizons. And I will just start a bit with the background. Um, so that the context is the changing conditions for hydropower and that we're in the transition to a more sustainable power system and it's both changing market conditions and changing regulation. So, of course, for the last few years, we've seen a lot of changes in, in the power price. Uh, and then you also had expectations for how the power chain power price might change in the years to come uh, and in general there's a lot of focus on flexibility and how uh, the value of flexibility might increase both uh, um, both through the markets that we use the most today and that other markets are becoming more important as well when it comes to regulation this is partly for hydropower specifically, uh, a lot of Nordic hydropower plants are going through revisions, meaning that they might have new type of constraints put on operation to ensure a sustainable power production. <clears throat> and it's a long time, often these licenses, they're valid for a very long time, 30 to 50 years. So there is a lot more knowledge available now, which kind of forms the basis for these processes. And there were also new political target targets. You can see that in Norway, but also uh, coming a lot from the European Union uh, to improve the sustainability in um, in rivers and lakes and water bodies in general. <clears throat> My PhD focuses on hydropower scheduling, how we operate this hydropower plant uh, with the focus on uh, stochastic medium and long-term planning. And I, uh, I'm in the Nordic, <laughs> the Nordic power system bubble, to put it that way. It's a hydropower dominated system. And I focus on the kind of top, top oh, yeah. How the hydropower system in the Nordic region is, uh, uh, <clears throat> how we have like larger cascades and kind of, uh, large dams that can store for a long time so that you need this uh, long-term planning and seasonal planning of the reservoirs. My PhD is based on four research questions. You don't have to read all of this, but basically the three first research questions, uh, they are focused on um, <clears throat> on what we call state-dependent environmental constraints or uh, basically, that the constraint depends on the water level in the reservoirs, which makes them more complex to model because it makes the problem non-convex, which is a a problem in these already kind of large optimization problems. Um, and it's I focus I'll come back to it, but I focus mostly on one type of constraint that we have. It's quite common here in Norway, so it's been like a lot of questions on how to handle this constraint in the scheduling. The last research question is more open, much broader, and it focuses on the, the, the interface between environmental constraints and flexibility on a slightly more general term. My PhD consists of five papers, of which uh, three of them are uh, journal articles and two of them are still under review. And that's sort of the basis for everything I'm presenting today. So if you want to know more, you can just read them. <laughs> These are the environmental constraints that I've touched upon. Reservoir ramping, flow ramping, minimum downstream flow, slightly minimum flow, but not that much. Um, and reservoir filling constraints. This is the constraint I work the most on because this is the one that is the most challenging to model. So I will come back to this and explain it a bit more. Uh, the first part of 
my work focuses on um, these two constraints, reservoir ramping and reservoir filling constraints. Both of them are state dependent so that they, um, uh, they change form depending on how much water you have in the reservoir, uh, making the problem not so nice. <clears throat> and this reservoir filling constraint or soft reservoir filling constraint, I also refer to it sometimes that, uh, as a state dependent maximum discharge constraint because actually a constraint on how much you're allowed to discharge from your reservoir but the target is to reach this uh, target uh, threshold <clears throat> so it's basically an alternative to having a minimum to say instead of saying like you have to reach this level within a certain week in the summer it's formulated so that you're not allowed to discharge until you reach that level and it might sound like the same thing, but it's not. And the point is that you're not, or the hydropower producer is not supposed to be punished for low inflow years because the amount of water that comes into the reservoir each year, year varies a lot. So basically you are in the winter period, you're allowed to produce as you want based on what you think is optimal. Then around when the snow melting start and the, you kind of move into the filling season, uh, this constraint might come or becomes active and you're not allowed to release water until you reach the threshold. When you reach the threshold, you're not allowed to go under the threshold. So you're allowed to produce, but you have to maintain this minimum level. And then it might also be followed by a period where you're not allowed to throw down the reservoir. But this is uh, one and two is kind of the standard for this type of constraint. Uh, the reservoir ramping constraint, it said how quickly you're allowed to draw down the reservoir. It could also be to fill up, but uh, in my work, I only focus on how quickly you're allowed to draw down. A quick question on terminology there. Is drawdown related to that or all year? Yes. In the, uh, uh, so it's a uh, depth or like how many centimeters, which is why it becomes, uh, also dependent on the volume in the reservoir because the shape of the reservoir and all that. So then it's sort of stricter in some parts of the reservoir than in others. Hmm. <clears throat> I just yeah. what's the reason why this constraint exists? I don't know much about it. But... <clears throat> this constraint in particular. And um, so this constraint, it's a, uh, uh, we call it an environmental constraint, but you could also say that it's a recreational constraint. It's also used other places in Europe in different forms. But uh, the idea is that you need, it's about access to water. If the reservoir is drawn down a lot, it's more difficult to get access to the, the water surface. So if the lake is also used for boating or fishing or swimming or other recreational use, it's, um, it often needs to have like a certain water level for it to be accessible for other use. And it looks nicer, <laughs> which sounds like a very superficial thing, but it, um, it matters a lot when you're hiking in the mountains in the summer, if all of the lakes are like looking very empty, people don't like that. Like... <laughs> but it can also be access for wildlife and it doesn't only need to be about human concerns, but I think it's fair to say that it's mostly about human concerns. <laughs> <clears throat> yep. And I used uh, stochastic dynamic programming in my models uh, because I need to represent this non-convexity. So actually the constraint in itself in the weekly so I solve it for weekly stochastic stages with three hour time steps. And then certain case in the inflow and price, it's the perspective of a power maximizing producer. And each weekly stage problem can be solved uh, as a linear problem because I can take the binary logic concerning the, uh, the state dependency or the water level dependency. I can handle that in the SDP algorithm itself and solve each optimization problem in the uh, SDPL model as a linear problem. Um, but 
the problem comes that um, since when you uh, calculate the expected future value curve, that curve is no longer necessarily convex or concave. So to represent this uh, shape, you have to uh, include uh, MIP modeling or a mixed linear programming. So that's what actually turns this problem, or when I solve it, what makes it uh, non-linear is to represent this um, future value, expected future value curve. While the constraint itself is actually linear in the problem. <clears throat> the setup is very typical for um, how hydropower plants are operated in the Nordic region. You calculate water values using a stochastic model like the SDP model I have, and then you use these water values to do a forward simulation of how you would operate the system under different weather scenarios. And that's also what I do to get the results for how it's operated. <clears throat> In the first um, part of my work, it's based on two case studies, Norwegian hydropower plants, one with one cascade and one with the two upper reservoirs and power plants in a longer cascade. <clears throat> and uh, there are environment constraints on these two reservoirs. Both of them have this type of state dependent uh, filling constraints, but they look slightly different. One of them, so this is how it's defined in the regulation that they have. One has this step up function, the other one is flat, and you can also see the blue here is the average inflow to the historically, and the red the dotted line is the maximum um, reservoir capacity. So <clears throat> you can see that uh, in hydropower system two, it's, it's more strictly defined. It's uh, basically more challenging to reach the threshold than for the first. <laughs> I've also uh, used different price assumptions. So there's a stochastic price in my model, but I've changed the expectation of this price to see how how that impacts how you plan for this type of constraint. Uh, so two different average seasonal profiles that you can see down here, and also different levels of price variability. <clears throat> So what are, are the main findings from this part of my work? Well, uh, <clears throat> if you consider the economic results, so first you can look at how does this constraint impact uh, the economics of the hydropower plants? Uh, how much does it reduce the income of the hydropower plant? And of course, that's very price sensitive. It depends on how how many high price periods you have within the constraint period. As you saw before, uh, the constraint is only active for a certain period. If you have more high price periods in, within that uh, period, <laughs> then uh, uh, then there is a, a larger impact on the, uh, on the economics. And then the second thing that I've looked into is, okay, but this constraint is there, it's always there. How much does it matter if you plan for it in advance? And <clears throat> when the constraint is active, you're, there's not that much you can do. You're not allowed to discharge, so you can't discharge. But you can plan in advance and decide how much uh, water do I have in my reservoir when the constraint becomes active. And this is also, so what we saw is how this is uh, also dependent both on the hydropower case and the, how the constraint is defined and the price. If you have an expectation for higher price within the constraint period, being either for uh, due to higher price variability or a seasonal profile that has higher prices in this period, then you will also naturally uh, want to reach the threshold sooner because then you have more flexibility. As soon as you reach the threshold, you're allowed to produce, but you have to stay above the threshold. <clears throat> and then, so there is an economic benefit of planning for this constraint. Um, and then in the most extreme case, it is 
cases, it was from like 1.4 to 2.6 percent. Uh, it's like the best improvement I found in the cases I've done, which is not huge, but it's uh, in, in these kind of uh, operational considerations, it's enough to that you would want to consider it in, the, in your long-term strategy. And it's higher, the higher the cost of the constraint is as well, which I think makes sense. Mm. But we also see a shift in the reservoir management or this, this improvement due to planning is caused by a shift in how you handle your reservoir management. And you also see a variation in the effectiveness of the constraints because um, you're not breaking the constraint, but since the target of the constraint is not the variable you're binding itself, uh, you can uh, have a different level of it, um, how well you achieve this. <clears throat> so, um, these are water value curves from uh, uh, Hydropower System 2, two in the high price, high variability case. So it's like the case with the most high price periods within the constraint period. And when you consider the constraint, it's the red curve here. What we see is that in general, the, the water values are lifted. And um, this is the threshold you can reach. It's active in week 22. It's not active in week 20. And then we calculate the water values in the using stochastic dynamic programming. It's a backwards recursion. So in week 20, this is before the constraint is active, you still see that the water values, the value of storing water in your reservoir, tells you that when you consider this constraint, it's more valuable to store water than when you don't consider this constraint in your modeling. So it's giving you a signal before the constraint is active to prepare for the constraint. But it doesn't always tell you uh, to save water. And uh, so this is uh, a, under a different price assumption. And here at the curve, you can really see uh, uh, the non-convexities in this uh, future expectance coming in. Like, so then uh, oh. normally you would always have like uh, falling water values for higher reservoir volumes, or the more water you have in your reservoir, the water value would be slightly decreasing. But there you can see this that it's actually increasing. And here it depends on the the filling degree that you would have in your reservoir. But um, normally at this time of year, you would be quite low. And here the water value is lower. So it's actually telling you that it's not worth saving water. <laughs> you should rather produce a bit more now before the constraint becomes active. And then just take the longer waits when you have to wait for the reservoir to fill up again. However, if you have a higher reservoir filling already, then it might be worth saving water like, and uh, reach the threshold sooner because then it's uh, a higher probability that you'll reach it quite soon. <clears throat> and then this is for one of the cases and then they can use the same price assumptions for a different case and it could be uh, basically no changes between the two curves at all so it's very sensitive to how strictly the constraint is formulated as well <clears throat> um so how well do we what's the effectiveness of the constraint well and uh, this shows the uh, share of the scenarios that has reached the threshold in different weeks. And when you just have the constraint in the simulation, but you haven't planned for it in, the, in advance, and um, you still see that when you have a high price expectation in the constraint period, you still reach it sooner in more scenarios because you still have an incentive to have more water to produce in the constraint period even though you don't consider the constraint. But when you do consider the constraint, you can see that it lifts even more because then you have an 
even stronger incentive to prepare for this period. Mm. But it could also be, yes, I had a slide as well. <clears throat> um, yes, okay. And, but in the, when, in the low price years, it might be, um, because this one here just shows the difference. So you can see that it lifts quite a lot for the high price years, uh, but for the low price years, it really doesn't and it's even like slightly negative so uh, if you don't expect any high prices in this period which traditionally is what is most likely because it's it's when um, the snow start melting and there's still more unregulated production also for hydropower in the region so then it might not uh, <clears throat> you might actually when you plan for the constraint think that it's better to produce more sooner, wait longer in the filling period. And then actually it means that the threshold is reached slightly later. And you can say that the effectiveness of those constraint is like slightly reduced. <clears throat> okay. So the second part of my work, I will not spend too much time on it, <laughs> uh, but uh, the methodology is quite similar. I still use STP. Uh, the main difference is that we now consider a very small system with a cost minimizing objective. There is also wind power production in the system, uh, a load that you have to meet. And there are some requirements for uh, reserve capacity that has to be met in the system. So this is the small system that I <laughs> use. <clears throat> and I consider the same reservoir filling constraints, uh, but I also looked at um, minimum down downstream flow and flow ramping. So uh, different ways of limiting how you can release water from your reservoir, basically. Um, yes. And there are these cons two hydropower reservoirs in a cascade and different levels of res reserve capacity requirements, or there are cases with different levels of reserve capacity requirements. And different environmental constraints. So I just consider one of them at a time. Um, <clears throat> so we see that naturally, or what makes sense for all the constraints, uh, when you add environmental constraints in the system, that the system costs increased. Uh, and you also get more curtainment of wind power. You don't manage to utilize the, uh, the wind power resources as well, uh, because you are limiting the flexibility of the hydropower to help balancing out the variability. Uh, for the first environmental constraint, which is the uh, reservoir filling constraints that we, that I talked the most about. Uh, <clears throat> we see, um, oh, yeah. this is a bit confusing, but uh, it's the reservoir filling constraint. This is a flow ramping constraint, and this is a minimum flow uh, constraint. You can produce, it goes through the turbine, but basically what the, he says is that you can never shut down your turbine. You have to produce at all times at the minimum level. And uh, they all impact differently the system and differently how you can meet or deliver different services. And I uh, don't think I will take time to go into all the details, but one thing that we wanted to look at in particular was the supply of reserves or reserve capacity. And hydropower plant one is the, the one that is constrained by the, when we add the constraints. So, and we look at downward spinning, non-spinning and upward spinning reserves. And in the first level, so this is a lower level of reserve requirements, and this is a higher level of reserve requirements. And here we can see that mainly 
the minimum flow requirement uh, is reducing the amount of downward spinning reserves that can be supplied. And we have some more unmet reserves here. And for the ramping constraint and uh, and the, the the state dependent or the soft reservoir filling constraint, uh, we see that it's actually slightly increased in the amount of downward spinning reserves. Um, but it's a a reduction in the upward reserves and especially for this uh, reservoir filling constraint. And that's because when you're not allowed to discharge from the rest of the war, you're not allowed to provide upward reserves either. Yeah, in this period, you can provide downward reserves as well. But since this is a time limited period, you can probably deliver more in other periods. <clears throat> uh, when you increase the level of the reserve capacity requirements, you see a much larger impact. The system is more constrained. It's more difficult to meet uh, all the requirements. Uh, and I think especially for the ramping constraint, there's a huge difference because here uh, now it's uh, now it becomes uh, impossible to meet all the the spinning reserve requirements, uh, which makes sense because here now you have a a power constraint it um, based on power and it's a difference from the minimum flow constraint because that one it changes the amount of energy your um, the regulated energy that you have in your reservoir it sort of takes out part of it and just this has to just be constantly produced throughout the year uh, and then you have less energy to move between the seasons and you get a more difficult energy situation in the winter period. While the ramping constraint, on the other hand, it limits the power more. And then it's not necessarily the energy problem in the winter, even though you might see this problem mostly in the winter as well, but it's um, it's the, the capacity to ramp up in a short period of time that is lacking. And then we also look at the marginal costs of meeting demand and these different type of reserves. And they have a, a, and you can see different, they have quite different shapes, even though all of them are kind of most intense at the late winter period. And it, this is related to this, if it's like energy or more power related uh, lack of resources. And also if it's uh, when the constraint is only defined for a, a part of the year instead of the whole year, it has a different impact. Uh, and I will not go through it now because I will just wrap up this part and say that uh, we do see in this part of the work that it, uh, depending on the type of constraints, it might impact your ability to deliver energy or reserves more or less, and it might be different type of reserves that is mostly impacted. And, and it also really matters with its timing, duration, and seasonality. And this also impacts how much value you have of planning in advance. So that's something that you can kind of relate to from the first part of the work. And so I will just stop there. And then uh, I will take some questions if you ask them. Thank you.